Welcome to our Lunch and Learn event entitled The Mystery of Mary Boyd. This is really appropriate as we enter March, the month of the Irish. And apologies in advance, I have a cold, so my voice might be a little raspy. I'm Lorraine O'Donnell, Senior Research Associate and Advisor at Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, Questgrant, and Affiliate Professor, School of Community and Public Affairs at Concordia University. I'll be moderating today's Lunch and Learn. This presentation will be in English, but with subtitles translated into French. Pour les sous-titres en français, veuillez choisir le bouton sous-titres en bas à droite de votre écran, cliquez sur afficher les sous-titres et cliquez sur l'onglet traduction. A few technical reminders, please remember to keep your microphones muted during the event. If you have any tech difficulties, please write a message in the chat and we will address it as best we can. We are recording the session today. It will be shared on our YouTube page. Um, and please write any questions you may have in the Q&A box, which you can find by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So um, colleagues, if you haven't started, please uh, start recording. Before continuing, I would like to acknowledge that while we meet today on a virtual platform, Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ghanaian Gahaga Nation is recognized as the custodian of these lands and waters. Chojoge, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. And today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We continue to reflect on the ways in which we can work in collaboration with Indigenous communities to form mutual and ongoing relationships. And something I'd love to um, chat with our speaker today later is maybe looking at some of the historic links between Indigenous and Irish communities in Quebec. This is, event is made possible through the financial support of the Secretariat aux relations avec les Québécois d'expression anglaise. Questgren also receives funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage, Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities, and Concordia University. And a final note, please note that this space is for intellectual exchange. Any views or opinions expressed in this talk do not necessarily represent those of Questgren or its funders. And I also wanted to note that this presentation will include discussions of sexual assault, abortion, mental health, and suicide. I will now pass you over to Mr. William Flock. Is William in the room? He is not. Okay, so what we'll do, uh, Jane, is we're gonna go ahead with the presentation. And then um, at the end, if Mr. Flock is able, able to make it to our event, we will give him a few minutes to say some words. So I am very pleased to introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Jane McGaughy holds the Johnson Chair of Quebec and Canadian Irish Studies at Concordia University and serves as Associate Professor of Irish Diaspora Studies. In fall 2022, Jane launched the Irish in Canada podcast, exploring histories and legacies of Irish immigrants and their Canadian descendants since the 18th century. And I'm happy to say uh, Jane McGaughy is also a Questgren researcher member. Jane? Hello, thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, my apologies uh, as well. I think we're all fighting the same cold. So uh, my voice is more Lauren Bacall today than it, it usually is. Uh, so apologies if I have to take a, a short tea or cough break. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, the screen share. All right. I hope that's that's now working for everyone. Lorraine, can I get a thumbs up that, that you can see the screen? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So today uh, I want to talk to you about the mystery of Mary Boyd. Uh, which is both a research project for myself, it's going to be the, the subject of my next academic book, 
but it's also become one of our most popular podcast episodes. Uh, so I thought I would begin today by explaining a little bit about the podcast, um, the reaction that we've had to Mary's story, and then share Mary's story with all of you so that you can get a, a sense of really one of the more intriguing stories that I've come across in, in the last 10 years of my own research. The story of Mary Boyd should be quite well known because at the time it was a major national scandal in the uh, in the spring of 1868. The inquest into Mary Boyd has been readily available online uh, since uh, digitization of, of major Canadian historical documents began in the past few decades. It's also been available in many public libraries for people to read. However, as far as I can tell, there's only been one academic citation about it before I discovered her story myself. The way that the podcast began was because of COVID, uh, as I'm sure many other people discovered Podcasts were a great way to deal with lockdown. Um, these were some of the ones that I started to listen to a lot during the lockdown. I also had the problem that I had published a book, which had the wonderful fortune of coming out in June of 2020, when no one could go out and see any of it. Um, and so I was left listening to a lot of historical podcasts, realizing that I wanted to do something to highlight some of my own work and also a lot of the work that I do here at Concordia with my students in my Irish in Canada class. And so I decided uh, once I became the Johnson Chair of uh, Quebec and Canadian Irish Studies to, uh, to start to look at the Irish in Canada as a podcast. This was a whole new venture for me. Uh, I've been an academic historian since I finished my PhD in 2008. I am not someone who likes the sound of my own voice especially now that it's an octave lower than it usually should be. Um, and uh, this was a, a major learning curve uh, for me to get through. Uh, what we ended up doing, though, was to take advantage of the amazing facilities that we have here at Concordia. This is a photo of me in our studio booth, um, which we have access to through the EV building here um, and the Faculty of Fine Arts, which we are tremendously grateful for. Um, I've also been really, really lucky with the team that I work with. Patrick McMaster, who is the tech whiz behind everything, is doing a double major, uh, half in Irish studies, but also in electromusic um, acoustics. And so I was able to tap into someone who is naturally really interested in stories about the Irish in Canada, but also knows how to work that crazy board that you can see there with all the knobs, which I have no idea what to do with. Um, and I'm also delighted that our producer, Mary Mulvena, has been able to be in studio with us for every single recording um, and has really been the finessing aspect for us. One of the, the major ways that um, I had to adapt my work was to learn how to speak like a human being. There are ways that you talk when you're giving a lecture, um, especially as I tend to do without notes. There are ways that you speak when you are writing uh, where I am a bit of a, a grammar fascist and, you know, find every split infinitive and every dangling participle. And then there's the way that you need to talk in a podcast, which has to be both academically sound, but also a little bit more conversational. Or as we call it, I needed to put in some of the Jainisms into my work. Um, this is a little bit blurry, but um, this is one of my uh, affected scripts where we sit down and I have to put in almost like music notation, where are the breaths, where do I need to put my voice up higher, drop lower, add a joke, raise an eyebrow, which somehow will then communicate itself as well through the microphone. We began the podcast uh, in September of 2022. This was our very first tweet about it uh, for our first episode. And I'm delighted to say that the third season just began today uh, on March 7th. Uh, and uh, we have a number of episodes to see us through most of the month of April. Um, and we started today with the story of Benjamin Lett. Being in charge of the podcast, I write, I research, I am the narrator for it. But I also am in charge of all of the social media for it, which is its own nightmare and adventure. Uh, I am in charge of running the website, which you can see here. Uh, I have to take care of our Facebook page. Uh, I have to venture into the intriguing world of X, formerly Twitter. Uh, and then I also run uh, all of our posts on Instagram, which is 
a little bit trickier because Instagram usually is just about the images. And so it's needing to get people to listen to things like little sound bites that we have uh, in order to make sure that the audio experience is also going to be there. This is our uh, total as of yesterday morning. We've had nearly 8,000 downloads. I'm really hoping that when I check tonight after the first episode of the third season dropped, we're going to be up more over 8,000. Um, but considering that we're a small three-person team, we're really, really delighted with how the show has been accepted since it started in 2022. So I'm, I'm going to skip to the story of Mary now. Um, and uh, if anyone has questions about the podcasting aspect, I'm, I'm happy to, to cover them in the Q&A. Um, I discovered the story of Mary Boyd uh, when I was lucky enough to have a fellowship in Canadian studies at the British Library. Uh, this is my normal chair, Humanities 2, about which I'm extremely territorial. Um, and I was sitting there calling up documents um, having to do with an Irish doctor who was in charge of the Provincial Lunatic Asylum in Toronto in the second half of the 19th century. And suddenly I had Mary's inquest in front of me. I started reading through it and then said a very, very bad thing that you're not supposed to yell in a place like the British Library, which rhymed with duck. Um, and uh, suddenly I realized I, I had this amazing mystery unfolding in front of me. Um, in order to help people follow with what I'm gonna do, I'm stealing a couple of images none of whom are real except for Joseph Workman. Um, but for the time being, let's pretend that Ruth Wilson is now Mary Boyd. This is really her as Jane Eyre. Um, the next character in the story is going to be a man called Duncan C Campbell, um, who was a noted homeopathic physician in Toronto. This is the real Dr. Joseph Workman, who I think looks incredibly like Jimmy Stewart. And uh, this is not Gilbert Blythe today. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be uh, Duncan's son, Lorne, also known as Posey in many of the major documents. So to begin the story of Mary, uh, Mary was an Irish Quebecer. She spent much of her life uh, in the township of Gore. Uh, her father, Thomas, and her mother, Sarah, had immigrated from Ireland um, sometime probably in the pre-famine era of the 1840s. Uh, we have them here. This is the 1851 Lower Canadian Census. Both the 1851 and 61 Canadian censuses are notorious for being extremely confusing, badly written, and basically badly done. But they're the best that we have to piece together some type of sense of who was in either Lower or Upper Canada in the mid-19th century. So we can see Thomas Boyd here uh, in the township of Gore. He's listed as a farmer from Ireland. Uh, he and his first three children were all born in Ireland, as, was, as well as his wife. Then his son Thomas is the first born in Canada, and then there's Mary at number 40. And you can see her birthday would be the 6th of June, and it was expected that she would be four um, on her next birthday, which probably puts her at about an 1847 birth. This is them 10 years later, still in the township of Gore. Um, and uh, the weird thing here is that Mary has suddenly shot up in age um, and is now older than her older brother Thomas. This is an example of why census records can be really wonderful and extremely unhelpful at the exact same time. For reasons unknown, which I'm still trying to discover, uh, the Boyd family decided to leave Gore and make their way all the way to um, Eldon in Victoria County uh, in Upper Canada. There were other Boyds in that area around the Kawarthas, uh, but so far I haven't been able to find any direct connection uh, between the families. Mary, however, didn't stay very long on the farm in the mid-1860s, because soon she was going to be making her way to Toronto as a single woman in order to try and find work. This is a quote from uh, historian Carolyn Strange in her great book on uh, Toronto and women's history. When single women left Ontario farms and small towns for paid work in Toronto, they came in search of wages, not notoriety, yet they attracted it all the same. And that really can be the story of Mary Boyd. Mary lived here, which if you know downtown Toronto, is an extremely busy corner. She lived uh, at Bay and King, um, and you can see uh, the, uh, the old parliament buildings at the end of the street. Where she lived is now part of the Bank of Montreal. Uh, but at the time, we know from census maps like this one, um, this is from 1880, but we can see just here the number 108 Bay Street. 
And we know from Duncan Campbell's census records that that was his address. And thanks to the Toronto Public Library, this is what his house looked like in about 1850. So the story that I'm going to be relating is going to be taking place for the most part here. Mary was young. Uh, she was probably only 19 or 20 years old. People liked her. Uh, the documents describe her as being tall, pretty, smart, good at her job, and well-educated, quote, for her position in life. Uh, the Campbells seemed quite fond of her. They saw Mary every day. She was a member of the family, um, except not. Uh, she was, as far as we can tell, the only maidservant in the house, which also meant that she was in the orbit of Lauren Campbell. Lauren, at this point, was a 17-year-old pre-med student uh, who was looking forward to following his father's footsteps with a career as a doctor. There are a lot of things that are said during the inquest into Mary's death, but there are very few facts that people tend to agree on. These are some of the only ones. We know that she went to go to work for the, uh, the Campbells in January of 1868. We know that less than five months later, she tried to kill herself, uh, first by trying to drown herself in the well at the back of the property. At that point, she was discovered by um, a young boy and who alerted Mrs. Campbell as to what was happening. And Lorne was sent to the Provincial Lunatic Asylum for admittance papers. So there was already a sense that they wanted to have her uh, incarcerated. Two days later, she made a second suicide attempt. Uh, she slit her throat with a carving knife in front of the family. Uh, she was then treated by Dr. Campbell. Uh, she had sutures put on her throat. And then she was taken to the Provincial Lunatic Asylum. She never left there. Uh, she died within the week on the 5th of May from gangrene from the throat infection that she had. However, she was able to speak for almost the entire time that she was there, apart from the end of the 4th of May into the early morning of the 5th. What she then said to the people working at the asylum becomes key because we'd never have Mary's voice herself, only what other people are saying. There was already confusion as to why she was there. This is uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, part of her diagnostic information in the patient register. Uh, she had been seen as being um, insane for the previous 10 days. Uh, the doctor, Dr. Workman felt that it was probably suppressed catamania. So she no longer had her period. However, Dr. Campbell, her employer, said that it was excitement caused by revival preaching. She was diagnosed with mania. It was noted that she had attempted to drown herself, but was now brought in with her throat cut, and that she then died uh, from eventually uh, traumatic injuries to her bronchial tubes. She died on the 5th, and then the coroner's inquest into her death began on the 6th to 7th May. Other than these facts, almost everything else about her life with the Campbells was about to be disputed. On the first day of the inquest, the people interviewed were Matilda Campbell um, and Duncan Campbell. Mrs. Campbell spoke first, and she swore that Mary had been of a religious turn of mind, so going along with that idea that revival preaching had been the reason why she had lost her mind. She said, quote, I did not take alarm until she threw herself into the well. Upon asking why she had done this, she said it was better to be drowned than to be burnt. Mrs. Campbell also added, it was her wish to go to the asylum because Mary had given so much trouble to the family. Because, heaven forbid, a young servant might be seen as an inconvenience. When he took the stand, Duncan Campbell corroborated a lot of what his wife had previously said, but he did add a few more details. Apparently, in the weeks before the first suicide attempt, he had noticed that Mary was becoming not herself. She would appear perfectly well, and then other times she would be talking about death and hell. And then he said this, she told my wife that her female condition was deranged. I used some remedies with a view of improving that condition, after which she was better. Dr. Campbell's remedies were not quite as innocuous as they sound here, just written in print. On the second day of the inquest, Dr. Joseph Workman came. Um, he is the Irish-born medical superintendent of the uh, Provincial Lunatic Asylum and someone who was very critical of homeopathic medicine, which put him at immediate odds with Duncan Campbell. Mary had only been in the asylum for five days, 
before the wound that she had became infected and she died. But Workman had seen her almost every day. He'd taken a real interest in her case. He'd spent time talking to her, reading with her, trying to calm her down. And it was his testimony that was going to then change everything. He relayed a conversation <clears throat> that he had with Campbell about Mary's menstrual problems, that her period had stopped, and that the restoration of this function was most important. But then he added this. Dr. Campbell's solution was the application of galvanic excitement to the breast of the female and the other extremity to the os uteri or the mouth of the womb. I'm one slide ahead, there we go. Um, after this, there appeared a discharge. So galvanic excitement, os uteri, what are we talking about? In order to bring on her period, Duncan Campbell, a homeopathic doctor, had attached electrodes or galvanic excitement to Mary's breasts and cervix and then used a form of shock therapy to cause menstruation. Even for the 1860s, this wasn't a standard medical practice. Galvanic medicine was being hotly debated at the time, but to use it as a form of gynecological treatment was beyond the pale. Was Campbell's impromptu treatment administered in his home? Really, because he had been so concerned that the maid in the house had an erratic period? And then, Workman revealed the real kicker. Campbell had told him that Mary was in love with his son, Posey, that they had to get married. Mary had said that Posey, quote, had sexual intercourse with her in her bed. But for Campbell, this couldn't be true, and it had to be a sign of her insanity. Workman then testified that he had not given a gynecological exam to Mary while she was alive in the asylum. It's here at the bottom. I made no critical examination in the case of Mary Boyd, as I adopt a rule to treat all females as I should wish my own daughter to be treated. If Joseph Workman had given Mary a full pelvic examination, a lot of important questions might have been answered. Mary's autopsy <clears throat> revealed no violent marks on her body except for the throat wound, which was self-inflicted, but her hymen was almost entirely gone. Although the doctors do note that this is not invariably a mark of the absence of virginity. In the end, the coroner's jury decided that Mary had come to her death by her own hand. You can see it here by means of a carving knife while laboring under temporary insanity. <clears throat> what I didn't expect to find when I was reading this in the British Library, however, was the last paragraph after all of the signed names. The jury impaneled in the case of Mary Boyd cannot part without recording their sense of the highly improper medical treatment pursued by Dr. Campbell towards the said deceased Mary Boyd. Following this rare public castigation from the jury, her body became embroiled in a very public fight. To understand how this sentence from the coroner's jury could be so explosive, we need to pull back a little bit and look at what else was happening in April and May of 1868, because a lot had been going on. At the beginning of the month of April, Thomas Darcy McGee, the Irish Canadian father of Confederation, had been assassinated in Ottawa, kicking off a panic about Fenianism. That worry about the Irish amongst us had only increased when in Australia, Queen Victoria's son, Prince Alfred, had been the victim of an attempted assassination by a Fenian. At the same time, here in Montreal, <clears throat> the city was seeing the uh, most notorious abortion trial yet experienced in the Canadian justice system. Robert Notman, pictured here, was the brother of the famous photographer William Notman, and he was found guilty of procuring an abortion for a young woman he had made pregnant. He was found guilty and sent to Kingston Penitentiary for 10 years. During the sentencing, the judge had admonished Robert Notman as follows. Why did you not, after you'd been tempted by that girl's beauty, after she had fallen, why did you not take her to your home and to your heart and make her a happy wife and a happy mother? In a country like ours, there are no social distinctions. She was worthy of you in every respect. If Mary Boyd had been pregnant, would the Campbells have received a similar admonishment? In a country that apparently had no social distinctions or barriers, why couldn't 
a young servant girl, have married Lauren Campbell. There is, of course, a huge difference between the idealism of this judge in Montreal and the lived reality of what Mary went through in Toronto. Newspaper coverage of what had happened during the inquest immediately caught on fire. In the coming weeks, many articles were filled with details about death, crime, sex, and abortion, with the very thinly veiled suggestion of a doctor performing a clandestine abortion by electrocuting Mary's cervix. The Toronto Telegraph had this remark, that if Campbell had believed there was even the slightest chance that she could have been pregnant, his decision to use galvanism was a criminal act. In order to defend himself, Duncan Campbell then started writing into the papers as well. He took personal offense that his name was being bandied about, but he also was extremely worried because, quote, there is a charge recorded against my son, a young man now preparing himself for the medical profession, which if it could be believed, might interfere with his success in life. As all that had happened before and all that would follow, all it seemed to be about in the end was Lorne Campbell's future career. So Duncan Campbell wrote in, he explained about nymphomania. He wrote about Mary as being an erotomaniac. He defined that as being someone who would be uh, in love because of melancholy or madness. And then he had this, <clears throat> excuse me, had this to say, quote, Mary Boyd never stated to me, nor to my wife, I'm quite sure, or to anyone else, that she had had illicit intercourse with my son. I am as positive as it is possible for me to be that she died as she had lived, a spotless virgin. What she told my wife was not that she had carried on illicit connection with my son, but that she had been violated by him a month previous. When I first read this in the British Library, my jaw hit the desk. Was Duncan Campbell really saying that instead of being in love with Mary, his son had raped her and that that was somehow better? When you read through it several times, it becomes clear that it wasn't that. Instead, if Campbell believed that Mary suffered from erotomania, as he defined it, this was an example of one of her sexual delusions. By framing it like this, Campbell thought he was both exonerating himself and his son. Alternatively, what Mary had shared could have been simply her trying to make sure that she would be believed by another woman because she had told this story first to Mrs. Campbell. Upon hearing her allegation, as we can see at the end of this uh, article, Campbell wrote that he had performed an ad hoc pelvic exam and concluded that her story wasn't true. Moreover, he also swore that Posey did not in any way encourage her infatuation, but was perfectly indifferent to her. And guess what? <laughs> At this point, Workman decides to write into the Toronto newspapers, and this is why this scandal then started to take on even larger proportions. But before you think that Joseph Workman wrote in to defend Mary like some Irish white knight, take a deep breath, uh, because he wasn't trying to defend her from any slander from Campbell's part. Instead, he was more interested in taking down Duncan Campbell as a rival physician, because he didn't agree with homeopathy. Workman also focused on Mary's virginity, or lack of it. Duncan Campbell needed Mary to be a religion-obsessed, lovesick, hallucinatory virgin. If she wasn't all of this, these things, then he and his son were going to be in trouble. Workman certainly felt that way. Any man who would employ gal galvanic excitement to the uterus of a young woman, of whose pregnancy he had even the shadow of suspicion, he wrote, is in plain language no other than a criminal abortionist and should be allotted his proper place in the world by the side of Notman, Robert Notman from Montreal, and other destroyers of life. As far as Mary Boyd's virginity was concerned, Workman was pretty emphatic on that point too. Any medical man, he wrote, who from inspection of the external parts after death in this case would assert that sexual intercourse had never taken place would be something more and worse than an ass. Say what you will about Joseph Workman, he did have a decent turn of phrase. <laughs> the dispute over Mary's body continued through the spring and summer of, of 1868. Campbell even went so far as to publish 
a 44 page pamphlet that included transcripts from the coroner's court, his own editorials on them, press articles, and a really, really bonkers interview between himself and a friend called Mr. Blank, where he completely redeemed himself from any wrongdoing and also called for Joseph Workman to be put into Kingston Penitentiary. Campbell in the end claimed that all of these efforts were to redeem from foul slander the fame of a modest and virtuous young woman. But he also had to end by including his defense of homeopathy as a reason why he wanted to defend Mary Boyd. Mary Boyd didn't matter by the end of this discussion of her death. Only parts of her did. By August of 1868, most people had forgotten about Mary and will pretend that this is her on the right again. Joseph Workman ended up remaining in his position as a medical superintendent of the Provincial Lunatic Asylum. Today, Joseph Workman is considered the father of Canadian psychiatry. He remained, Duncan Campbell, however, just go ahead a little bit. Oh, wrong slide. We'll just pretend. <laughs> Duncan Campbell um, actually came out of this perfectly well, despite all the things that were said about him in the newspapers by The Telegraph or Dr. Workman. When he died, he died one of the most beloved physicians in Toronto in 1878, and to the end, a defender of the medical benefits of galvanism. It's also intriguing to note that he had an Irish maid still working in his house. The person who I can't find a lot about is Lauren Campbell. You can find some. I know that he did finish his medical degree. I know that he ended up in Thunder Bay. I know that he got married to a woman who was a little bit younger than Mary Boyd. He had three children and he died in his mid thirties. But in terms of his feelings about this case, I haven't found anything from him, him specifically yet. I'm still looking. And as for Mary herself, I'm left with a lot of questions. When people usually hear this story from me, the first thing they think of is Alias Grace, Margaret Atwood's best-selling novel that recently, a few years ago, was turned into a miniseries. People think of Mary Whitney from the tale of Alias Grace, and that's her on the left. Mary Whitney was a young maid in Toronto who died from a botched abortion after having an affair with the son of the house. But Mary Whitney was a fictitious character. She never was real. Mary Boyd was real. I have these kinds of questions at the end of so far in my research. Why are the timelines in what happened to Mary so confusing and contradictory? I've left out a lot in the presentation today for timing, but you can listen to the podcast episode about this and hear just how much Workman and his nurses are in complete disagreement with Campbell about when and why Mary was treated. Why would Campbell publish a pamphlet like this with such self-incriminating information? Why and when was the galvanic battery used on Mary? How many times? It seems from Campbell that it was used only at the end of April, but one of the nurses at the asylum claimed that Mary said she had first been used um, as an experiment with it in mid-March. What kind of interactions did Mary really have with Lorne Posey Campbell? What kind of issues of consent does this raise? A lot of Campbell's defense of his son seems to hinge on the fact that no 17-year-old boy is physically capable of having sex, which I think we can probably dispute. Why did Campbell go to the lunatic asylum to see Mary many times? Was it just out of the goodness of his heart? Or was he worried that she might reveal something? Because Workman and the nurses on the case certainly were aware that Mary did not want to see Duncan Campbell ever again. And finally, in my Sherlock Holmes moment, who benefits? Who benefits from lying about what happened to Mary? Is it Joseph Workman because he's able to then take down a rival with whose medical performance he completely disagrees? Is it Duncan Campbell and Mrs. Campbell because they don't want it known about what happened in their own house? And Campbell in the end realized that he was possibly guilty of performing an abortion. Is it Lorne because his medical career was at stake and in the end that was more important than Mary's life? In the end, I'm still uncovering more of the mystery, but it's one that I find completely fascinating and I hope 
if you listen to the podcast or hopefully in the future, read my book about this, you'll find it interesting too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Magahi. That was um, a riveting story. And Apologies I, for my voice. It's getting worse every minute. <laughs> the two of us are managing. <laughs> That's a big cup of tea you've got there. I have a um, second. The, I am. Um, I have questions and sure. um, I'm encouraged those in the audience who have questions to put them in the Q and A feature at the bottom. Uh, while we wait for some of those, um, two that come to mind. Uh, I'll start with this one. Could you explain who the Fenians are and why people? Yeah, were sure. Sorry. Them? Thank you. Uh, so the the Fenians uh, were Irish physical force nationalists who believed that there was no constitutional solution to Irish freedom, that it needed to be fought for physically and in military fashion. Uh, they had invaded Canada in 1866, famously. Um, they were blamed as being the conspirators at the heart of McGee's assassination. And they were seen as possibly one of the reasons why Canada became a country when it did in the 1860s, because of this fear that the Fenians were amassing on the American border and would be um, wanting to, to basically attack Canada to trade it for Irish freedom. Um, so they were very skilled militarily. Uh, their belief in how much Canada valued in the British Empire was maybe a little bit off. Thank you, Jane. Um, and there was Fenian action in Quebec as well as- There was, at Pigeon Fenian. Hill, absolutely, yep. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Rachel Wilcoxon. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane, do you know if this type of treatment was common for Irish women working in domestic service during this time? So in terms of abortions being procured for anyone in domestic service, um, they did happen. Uh, for it to happen because of advances in galvanic excitement as a medical theory, uh, was seen as being one of the major problems with what Campbell had done. Um, abortion was um, outlawed in Canada, obviously, um, but uh, things were done. What's interesting to me is that um, there's a history through the 1840s, 50s, and 60s in America of uh, Black enslaved women um, and freed women and Irish immigrants uh, being used as basically medical guinea pigs for what we now think of as some standard gynecological practices, but at this point we're just being tested for the first time, often tested on the, these women without anesthetic um, in front of dozens of medical students. Um, and one of my questions with this case now is to what extent was the border very porous in terms of medical theory and application? And were some of these gynecological practices also being tested out on Irish women or Irish Canadian women um, because they were seen as being hypersexual, um, because they were seen as being expendable um, within the laboring classes. Um, so I'm gathering evidence for that. Um, it's uh, not quite as well documented, but we do know that that there was a lot of shared information between uh, Canadian physicians, um, almost on a triangular basis between Britain, Canada, and the United States. So um, it's one of the things I'm, I'm looking for, but galvanic excitement was usually not used on anyone's uterus. Uh, that's that's what got uh, Campbell into trouble with, with fellow doctors. Thank you. Um, there's a great uh, comment and question in the chat from Michelle McLeod. Hello, my family lives on Boyd Lake in Wentworth, so it's especially fascinating to hear your research, Jane. Thanks for sharing and reframing her story. Do you have a sense about how common and the reporting of this type of event and discussion of women's bodies was in newspapers? Was it more common because of the Robert Notman case? And I'll add on to that. I'm curious about the Ontario, Quebec kind of mm -hmm. intellectual world where these stories were moved around between the provinces. So uh, in terms of uh, the discussion of women's bodies, this was not done to such an extent in the 1860s. Uh, Campbell includes an apology for it in one of the times that he wrote into the newspapers, but again, frames it as, I have to discuss women's hymens like this because this is about protecting my son. 
Um, but, you know, we're talking about high Victorian, upper Canadian and lower Canadian societies, which, you know, this this was considered beyond the pale. Um, discussions of abortion were very much in the news um, that week that that Mary went into the asylum. That That's the week that, that Notman was sentenced. So I actually have news in Montreal. It had traveled to Montreal of, of her attempted suicide because a maid trying to kill herself in the home of a noted physician was considered newsworthy even as far away as, as Montreal. And it's right next to another abortion case um, of a doctor being found guilty. And on the next page is the Robert Notman trial. Um, so it was in the ether, um, but uh, it, I, I don't believe that um, the amount of detail that was imparted from this case was normal for any coroner's inquest. Um, you could access the documents, they were public documents, but for that much of it to be reprinted, that was Campbell's decision, and it's why we have the case today in such detail. Um, and then, sorry, your question in terms of the, the porous border? Well, um, I was interested in in how um, the McCord story made it to Toronto, and obviously yeah. the Toronto story made it back. You, you um, know, was, there, was there a kind of trans-border, cross-border? There's, a, there's a, lot of, a, a lot of movement, um, between Montreal and Toronto medically because most of the physicians were trained at McGill a lot. Um, and uh, Workman had done his P, uh, his MD at McGill during the cholera crisis, uh, the cholera epidemic in 1832. Um, and so there was movement. There was also a lot of movement of people um, back and forth between Quebec City, Montreal, Kingston, Toronto, that, that whole stretch. Um, and so... Uh, Certainly, for professionals to be sharing opinions, that was that was the the provinces were not separated like that. It also was at this point only recently two separate provinces. It had been the United Province of Canada from eighteen forty one to sixty seven. Uh, so, in that sense, it it was all shared. Um, this is just after Confederation, uh, and so the sense of Ontario and Quebec they had always been the separate Canadas to a certain extent, but. Um, the Ontario College of Physicians is just starting. That's really interesting. We, we our our events and our our um, focus at Questgren is very much on Quebec, and it's very useful to be reminded of the larger um, mm -hmm. context. Comments are coming in fast and furious. So here's um, an interesting one that touches on both history and heritage, Jane. Mm -hmm. Uh, Laurie McEwen writes, my Canadian Irish ancestry comes from Goy Gore. Mary Boyd is in my family tree and I've been oh, wow. looking for her burial plot. I, I am too. <laughs> oh, okay. So I understand she was cremated, which was unusual at the time. Question mark. Did the asylum have a graveyard, which is now a park? So, so um, it goes you on. Know, you know <laughs> more than I do in terms of the cremation. I have been looking about what happened to Mary's body, um, because in the records that I've been going through, um, there's no follow up on what happened to her body uh, after the coroner's inquest. The graveyard at the Provincial Lunatic Asylum did not begin until the 1870s. I've gone through all of the records for the Toronto Necropolis. Um, I've gone through the records for Eldon Township that I can find. Um, I've looked as much as I can at what's available in, in Gore Township, and I haven't been able to find her or her father who also died in the uh, the a few years afterwards, um, and my hypothesis up until hearing right now about a possible cremation uh, is that her body might have been donated to the uh, University of Toronto Medical School because that often happened with uh, unclaimed bodies from the provincial lunatic asylum. Uh, that said, her father was at the inquest. He had gone. He had not been allowed to see her. Um, in the last hours before her death because it was considered too traumatic for him. Um, but he might have been there to collect her body, but then what happened with it afterwards, I'm not sure. So if if you're aware of, of how, how she was cremated, because cremation was not really done very much back then, um, I'd, I'd be fascinated to follow up with you offline. Okay, so that's um, a, uh, an offer to you, um, Laurie McEwen. Shannon Bell writes, what are your plans for the future of this research and story? Will you continue to look or have you exhausted all the resources that you think are out there? From what you I'm, just said, it sounds like maybe not. 
Um, I'm, I'm continuing to look. Um, I, I, I had one student who volunteered his family in Thunder Bay. He was like, I can see if Lauren has anything in the Thunder Bay city archives. I was like, that'd be great. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm in the midst of writing the manuscript, but as I write, there are more questions. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship at the moment between searching and writing. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to get a manuscript finished on this uh, within the next year. We look forward to that. Um, Kathleen Beatty wrote, I, it's just a comment. Hello, Dr. McGaughy. My ancestors were pioneers in Gore. Edward Beatty's wife, Mary McGaughy, had her first child during the immigration trip from Ireland to Argenteuil. One of her sons married Isabella McGee. McGahey. So there you go, some genealogical information for you. And Shannon added on to her question, maybe a screenplay, kidding, not kidding. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it, it lends itself to something a bit a bit dramatic, certainly. Um, maybe one more time has passed since the Alias Grace miniseries. Um, but uh, I, I, the way I want to tell this is not, a, you know, a boring academic book. I want this to be a book that you know, people want to to read and feel feel as a bit of a a thriller, but not fictitious. So I'm I'm sort of experimenting with the format a bit and how I'm telling it, which has really come through a lot from from being able to tell it through a podcast. Um, Guy Bieener Bieener writes in terms of rediscovery of interest. Can you comment on the responses to the podcast episode on Mary Boyd and how this is influencing your research, maybe infusing it with current concerns? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, so um, I've I've had mainly only positive comments about, about the podcast episode, which has been very nice. Um, I... Uh, I was approached by the, the Dictionary of Canadian Biography because of the podcast episode to write an entry for Mary Boyd. Um, there are some women in the DCB. There are not enough. There, there's also a lack of, of uh, Irish Quebecers um, in it for, uh, who are female. So I was delighted to be asked, and, and that's in the process of, of being published. Um, but it, it sort of struck me when I was asked that, you know, Grace Marks, who's the the center of alias grace the real grace marks doesn't have a page in the dcb um emily murphy um irish canadian first wave feminist doesn't have a page in the dcb mary boyd will um and so in in that case i i think that the podcast has helped to to give mary a voice again um of some sort uh which i'm i'm really proud of um because i i find it appalling that she was so written out of her own death um, and that it really just became about her reproductive organs um, and nothing about who she was, what she went through. Um, there's very little about her experience with the, the household that we can find other than snatches within the testimony from that inquest. Um, so uh, so Mary will be part of the DCB, which I, I find to be maybe the most important thing to come from the podcast so far. Thanks, Guy. Um, Kathleen Beattie writes, Margaret Atwood is an, an amazing historic researcher. Do you not mm -hmm. think that, well, do you not think that her Grace Marks is based on Mary Boyd? No, uh, her, I mean, Grace Marks is, is based on Grace Marks, who was a real Irish woman uh, who came over as a teenager uh, in the early 1840s um, and uh, who then was found guilty of uh, committing a double murder um, along with uh, her fellow worker on the farm, McDermott, um, and then was incarcerated in Kingston Pen for 29 years. And then she disappears from the historical record, which is one of the reasons why Margaret Atwood was able to really invent what wasn't written down in the historical record. And she, she makes a note of saying that, that everything she wrote about Grace, she had to play truthful to anything that was factual, but anything else she could invent. Um, I'm not aware if she knew of Mary Boyd as a as an inspiration for Mary Whitney, but I also think that abortions among domestic servants, whether forced or sought after, were not uncommon. Um, and and so I think that in that case, she was writing more of a universal story than one specific to Mary Boyd. 
Um, we have a couple of minutes left and um, I was in contact with Mr. Flock who wasn't sure he would be able to say a few words. So I'll, I'll take the time to ask you one final question. Um, if you can answer it in a minute or two. Okay. And it, it's a, a general one and it, it has to do with um, a challenge. Those of us who work in the field of women's history encounter a lot and you you touched on it is the question of sources. So there are mm. sources um, about women and not so many by women. And I wonder if you have something to say about that and particularly about uh, Irish women, uh, working class Irish women, um, and whether you have some reflections through your work on Mary Boyd. Um, the, the first reflection is just the, the horrible silence because it's it is very difficult to find primary sources for this. Um, to, to we we know that Mary could read and write. We know that from her her hospital admission at the asylum. Um, and so it's not that oh she she was illiterate and so we don't have a, a story of her. Uh, she was well educated. Um, we just don't necessarily have the documents that have survived. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, one of the key sources I've been finding for people who are not famous, who are, who are you know not either famous or infamous, are often through things like like ancestry and and the, this whole wave of genealogical research because people have things in their attic that never ended up in the Bibliothèque Archive Nationale or uh, the LAC in Ottawa, um, and so there's a chance always that we might be hearing more voices from the past. Uh, in terms of stories of Irish women, I find that they often are reduced always to the worst stereotypes. Um, potato eaters, lar very thick brogue, hypersexual, um, violent. Uh, and so I'm hoping that in, in looking at some of Mary's story, I can refute some of that. Um, my larger research project right now is looking at the incarceration of Irish women in Quebec and in Ontario in the asylums before Confederation. Um, and there is a lot of discussion about who is violent, who is not, who is there because of a pregnancy, not because they were determined insane. Um, and so, it, you know, the asylums being used as almost a type of social control on Irish immigrants and Irish descendants because of presumptions about uh, their behavior and their sexuality. So I'm having to use again a second, like a, another voice, doctors' voices, voices of those recording the the registers. Occasionally, voices from family members filling out questionnaires. Um, it's not as great as a diary. A diary would be wonderful. Letters would be wonderful. Um, and if I can find them for the Boyd family, I would be delighted because I do know that there are descendants, as as we heard today. Um, and Mary had many siblings, um, only one of whom predeceased her. Uh, as a young child. So uh, there's a chance always, but there's also things like fires and floods and things being thrown out. So as I always say to everyone, and I'm going to say it in the podcast this season, don't throw out your stuff. Give it to an archive. Print out all of your emails and give them to an archive. Um, inspiring words. Uh, thank you. Dr. Jane McGaughy for this really fascinating and um, in-depth discussion about an important historical figure. Uh, thank, thank you Ryan. for all Cheers. for attending today's event. We always want to hear your feedback and we invite you to fill out the evaluation form for today's lunch and learn. You will find the link in the chat. Um, we have another lunch and learn coming up in March. Uh, in this year's series, and it's on a topic that's really different, but related to media, avoiding the news desert, addressing challenges around community media in English speaking Quebec. It takes place next Friday, the 15th, and the link is in the chat. The best way to learn about what's coming up in our programming is to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already, or to follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn. And there's another link where you can sign up. And in closing, I would like again to acknowledge that this event is made possible through the financial support of the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise. And that Quasgren also receives funding from Department of Canadian Heritage, 
Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities and Concordia University. I would like to thank my colleague Anna Hunt for organizing this event and Lina Shumarova for technical assistance today. Thank you again to Jane McGaughy for um, and for to all of you for attending. It's been a really great kickoff to March and the Irish month and giving us a lot of food for thought that goes beyond the cliches. Thank you.